I'm just uh, waiting whilst people find their seats, whilst Zoom populates. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, meeting, the first of Michaelmas term of the Cambridge Seminar, the future of the island of Ireland. This, uh, our 23rd meeting from having started in the midst of the pandemic, we're absolutely thrilled to be joined by Dr. Maeve O'Rourke, on the subject of Ireland's church, church and state abuse, the questions of transnational justice. And Maeve is going to be in conversation with her own professor, Eugenio Biagini. Um, I've known Maeve for a long time. We were students together in UCD. So it's the first time I think somebody who I shared an undergraduate journey with has come back to speak on the series. So it's really nice to have you, Maeve. Um, in a few moments, you'll see a notice in the in the chat about our mailing list and our social media activity in case you want to know about upcoming events in the series and indeed the bounty we have of recorded past discussions. I'm going to very quickly introduce our speaker and our discussant now before handing over to Eugenio. So Dr. Maeve O'Rourke is a lecturer at the Irish Centre for Human Rights at the University of Galway where she founded and directs the ICHR's Human Rights Law Clinic. Maeve has long advocated on behalf of survivors of Ireland's historical institutional and forced family separation system. It's really a huge pleasure to have you, Maeve. Maeve is going to be in conversation with Professor Eugenio Biagini. Professor Biagini is a professor of modern and contemporary history at the University of Cambridge and fellow at Sydney Sussex College. His current research focuses on the history of religious and ethnic minorities in 20th century Ireland. And indeed it was myself and Eugenio who started this enterprise way back when, and it's fun to be still doing them, Eugenio. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Maeve. Uh, thanks a million. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. That's such a crucial part of your events. Um, I will try to uh, summarize as best I can. And so to, um, conclude so that we have plenty of time to chat. Um, the title for the discussion this evening that I proposed is Ireland's Church State Abuses and the Question of Transitional Justice. And hopefully it'll become clear that that framing as an issue of transitional justice gives us the opportunity to really focus on why questions of past abuse are so central to the future of the island of Ireland. I'm very conscious that that is the theme of um, this series and I really do welcome that opportunity to focus on the future and what we can learn and what um, justice for the so-called historical abuses perpetrated in institutions and through the family separation has to do with the future. So um, I will focus on what is a large part of my academic research and legal advocacy work, that is the 20th century history and the ongoing legacy of institutional and family separation abuses, both north and south of the Irish border, albeit most of my work concerns the experiences of people in um, today's Republic of Ireland. Now, my focus on institutional and family separation abuses does not, of course, account for all of Ireland's history of either systemic gender based or systemic institutional abuses. What Professor Jim Smith at Boston College has described as Ireland's architecture of containment. Um, the academics Owen O'Sullivan and Ian O'Donnell have estimated that by 1951, and of course drawing on archival evidence, by 1951 more than 1% of the Irish population was incarcerated in one institution or another. Um, and of course a huge proportion of this was in psychiatric institutions and without uh, legal authority. And I'm very conscious that those institutions, they do crop up as part of the experience of many people I've worked with who were also institutionalized in a Magdalene laundry, a mother and baby home or an industrial school. Um, but they have not been part of, I think it's fair to say the wider public conversation. They certainly haven't been part of state responses and they haven't been a large part of what um, academics uh, such as myself have focused on, although I think we have made an effort to recognize their relevance, but it is a huge 
um, an important gap so far, and it makes up an enormous part of that architecture of containment. And importantly, um, those were state run institutions. Um, and so the question of church state collaboration is more nuanced there indeed. So um, I have worked uh, over the past 14 years with people affected by industrial schools, Magdalene laundries, county homes, mother and baby homes, the adoption system as a whole, um, the fostering and boarding out system. And as I say, also people affected by those institutions and experiences may have had some experience also of psychiatric institutions. Um, it's not the focus of my comments today, but a key area of academic work for me at present um, is the abuse of older people arising from deprivation of liberty for care, so-called care, and other forms of state neglect of older people's needs and their right to respect for their dignity. Um, so I don't think it's fair to say that institutional abuse is a thing of the past. It's certainly something that I'm, you know, very conscious of, given that a whole other area of my work is the institutional abuse today of older people. I'm going to focus in these remarks on what human rights law requires, and that is the focus of the work that I've done on the historical institutional family separation abuse. What human rights law requires where people have suffered gross and systematic human rights violations. That is to say, where the state has failed to protect people at a gross and systematic level from abuse, violence, exploitation, um, that the state either was participating in or had clear grounds to know about. And as we'll come to discuss, the basic framework for redress or reparation or justice broadly conceived, that derives from international instruments, from the pronouncements of, for example, the UN Committee Against Torture, and that shows up in the political con concept of transitional justice, is a framework that involves truth, justice, reparation, and institutional reforms, or guarantees of non-repetition, and memorialization has been added to that framework as well. I mentioned the concept of transitional justice also because it is a concept that is very well known to the community in Northern Ireland. Um, it is the, I suppose, um, it is the notion of rebuilding, reestablishing um, or creating uh, a human rights respecting de democratic uh, state in the aftermath of uh, widespread abuse and violence. Um, the idea being to transform the roots of what came before. And certainly I'm not alone um, in suggesting that this framing has relevance to uh, large scale abuse of an institutional and uh, gender-based nature such as we see in the church and state run institutions and family separation system um, in you know, settled democracy. So what I'm going to do now, having made those initial remarks is discuss my personal involvement in uh, researching and advocating in relation to the institutions that I mentioned um, and the family separation system. And then I make a few concluding reflections, remarks, um, having brought you through a summary of the work that I've done. It feels a bit um, self-indulgent, I suppose, to approach this uh, presentation by talking about the work that I've done. Um, but then again, I have reflections to offer on the role of lawyers, and it gives me a chronological way of summarising um, work that, as I'll explain, has been done by a large movement of which I've been a participant. Um, and by my description of events, you will then come to understand certain details about the abuses at stake and also state responses and also the, um, the uh, actions of survivors and others in their um, effort for justice. So to begin in May 2009, 
The report of the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse was released on the 20th of May 2009 and this was a report that had taken approximately 10 years to um, come to fruition. It was released by Mr Justice Sean Ryan and it summarised and made findings and recommendations in relation to the um, endemic abuse of approximately 42,000 children in industrial and reformatory schools and orphanages run by 18 religious orders, but regulated and inspected and funded by the state during the 20th century, with committals of children made through the court system. I remember being in my early 20s, having just finished my final year of my law degree in University College Dublin and sitting watching five days later a television programme called Questions and Answers, where there was a government minister on a panel and then the microphone was handed to people in the audience. And a man called Michael O'Brien took that microphone. He had been a Fianna Fáil councillor and he was a former mayor of Clonmel. And he, it, this I think must have been the first time I'd actually encountered a person describing um, their experience of horrific sexual and physical abuse as a child in one of these church run state funded industrial schools. I had been reading about it for the past few days, I suppose, maybe hearing about it on the radio, but this man, Michael O'Brien, took the microphone and said to the minister on the panel about how he had been rounded up uh, with his siblings by the cruelty man, which is how the inspector of the Irish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children had been described, brought to court, and that the first night in came the priest at the end of the bed going like this, and how his wife was the only person who really understood how he still, uh, at night time, couldn't sleep, had nightmares, he described how the religious order had brought priests or people from Rome to cross-examine him when he had applied for a redress payment through the accompanying redress board that had been set up in 2002. And I just remember being completely lost for words. And when I was able to say anything, saying to my dad, who was sitting beside me, I don't know why I'm going anywhere to work on human rights. I was about to go to Harvard to study for my master's in human rights. I definitely had ambitions to work at the UN and I saw human rights as an international focused, I suppose, discipline and field of work. And um, that really was a defining moment for me. Once I got to Harvard, I was studying, among other things, sex equality with Professor Catherine McKinnon. She gave us um, a lot of uh, latitude to write essays on whatever we felt was important to deconstruct from a gender perspective. And I wrote my first essay for her class on the gendered aspects of our emerging reckoning with church, state, historical abuse, and realized that institutions specifically designed for girls and women had not been included in the inquiry of the Commission to inquire into child abuse, nor had they be include, been included in the preceding apology in 1999 by then Taoiseach Bertie Ahern or in the Residential Institutions Redress Board. And I remember going to office hours with Catherine McKinnon and talking to her about the Magdalene Laundries, which I had then started to research. And I remember saying, I'm realizing the women, if they escaped, may still be alive and they have no pensions from this time, they have no acknowledgement. And she said to me, what are you going to do about it? And in all seriousness, and I think there was also something about the environment of Harvard being a place where everybody was being educated, not just to apply the law, but to make the law. Um, a highly critical approach to learning about law, where it came from, what it's doing, uh, whether it needs to be like this, what other laws are available, how could we reimagine everything? And I said that I would 
start by writing my master's thesis about it, but I very quickly met Professor Jim Smith in Boston College, who at that point had written a book about Ireland's Magdalen laundries and the nation's architecture of containment, had been contacted by a survivor living in America who had read his book and asked him what they were going to do about this injustice that had not been recognised. And he had joined forces with Catherine O'Donnell, Professor Catherine O'Donnell in University College Dublin, who was then Director of Women's Studies at UCD, and with Claire McGettrick and Mary Steed, who had set up an organisation called Justice for Magdalens. So a brief description of the beginnings of Justice for Magdalens, I think, is warranted. Um, the organisation was set up in 2003 by Angela Newsom, Mary Steed and Claire McGettrick, who are all adopted people. And between them, Mary's and Angela's mothers had spent more than 60 years in Magdalen laundries. This brings out the connection between Magdalen laundries, which existed to incarcerate girls and women, but without legal authority, um, who people felt, whether it be nuns, priests, state institutions, social workers who may, were a combination of state employees, but also for a large part of the 20th century, lay religious organizations funded by the state, perhaps family members, judges who didn't want to commit a certain woman to prison, by people who felt that society would be best served by those girls and women being out of the way and institutionalized. And they were indefinitely detained and forced into unpaid labor, washing commercial laundry, which the state was heavily involved in contracting for without making sure that girls and women were receiving um, wages. Um, and in 2003, Mary Raftery, um, the late amazing journalist revealed that 10 years previously in 1993, the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity had sold a plot of land that was on their former Magdalene Laundry site in Drumcondra. And they had received, obtained uh, a license from the Department of Environment to exhume and cremate 155 Magdalene women's bodies without providing names or death certificates for over half. Um, and at that point, Justice for Magdalene's was formed with the aim of achieving justice in relation to the Magdalene Laundries in the memory of those women, for the families of those women, and for women who had survived and were still alive as well. Um, and when I met Jim Smith, Justice for Magdalene's had been going uh, for six years at this point. Jim's book had um, summarized quite a lot of archival evidence of state involvement in the Magdalene laundries. And together with Jim, JFM had started having meetings with civil servants. Um, and saying there's a need to recognize this abuse and to make reparation uh, first and foremost to provide pensions uh, to the women and other forms of rehabilitation and recompense. Um, and Jim said to me that they hadn't been getting anywhere. They had been receiving the same response from civil servant after civil servant. These were not state regulated institutions. They were not like the industrial and reformatory schools. They were private. Um, and he said that then Senator Michael D. Higgins had suggested at one of their presentations in the Oireachtas that they should try to use the Irish Human Rights Commission inquiry process. So I used my master's thesis as an opportunity to write the legal submissions to the Irish Human Rights Commission, seeking an inquiry on the basis that the evidence Jim had obtained of state involvement and awareness of the Magdalene Laundries, combined with testimony I transcribed from what were very few interviews on RTE radio, for example, or Channel 4, a documentary called Sex in a Cold Climate, that this evidenced forced labor, servitude, if not slavery, and that far from being abuses that we only recognize now, these were abuses that since the 1930 forced labor um, convention of the International Labor Organization, Ireland had been obliged, certainly not to participate in, and to criminalize 
and to prevent. And that the very fact of not regulating properly the Magdalene laundries while being heavily involved was a gross um, dereliction of duty under international conventions, also the Irish Constitution and later on the European Convention on Human Rights. So that was how I began. The Irish Human Rights Commission recommended an inquiry by autumn 2010. I was then in London. I started to meet women um, introduced to me by the Irish Women Survivors Support Group and took their witness statements and went to the UN Committee Against Torture with those statements and with legal arguments beyond forced labour that these institutions, the treatment of women and girls there also amounted to everything from torture and other forms of ill treatment to arbitrary detention to denials of rights to education and respect for private and family life, et cetera, et cetera. In the summer of 2011, following the intervention that was widely publicized internationally and in Ireland of the UN Committee Against Torture, the government set up a civil servant led committee to establish the facts of state involvement with the Magdalene Laundries. And at this point, a barrister called Raymond Hill in London had come to ask Justice for Magdalene's if he could assist our advocacy. And he had a lot of experience of state-led inquiry processes, we might call it, and said that we needed to do our own parallel process because this was not a statutory process. Its rules and procedures were unclear. It was established to look at the facts of state involvement rather than the question of abuse of girls and women in the institutions. So I worked with my colleagues in Justice for Magdalene's and with Raymond to gather 800 pages of witness testimony of women who had been in Magdalene laundries. And this formed also the pilot of the oral history project of Justice for Magdalene's that today has 84 transcripts um, in it available online, many also in audio form. And we gathered 4,000 pages of other evidence from the archives and created a 150 page legal submission to that committee, uh, making legal arguments about the treatment and the state's responsibility and also recommendations for reparation. This document was so important when the committee issued its report, which did not make findings of abuse of girls and women in the Magdalene laundries although it could not avoid making findings of widespread state involvement with the institutions. And we needed to use that document, which summarized the women's testimony to show the public and to enable politicians to speak about what the girls and women had suffered and what was now due from the government. And on the 13th of um, February, 2013, the Taoiseach at the time, Enda Kenny did offer a state apology. And we then resourced survivors with questionnaires that enabled them to state their needs in terms of redress to Mr. Justice John Quirk, who then was the head of the Irish Law Reform Commission, who the government gave the job of um, coming up with ex gratia redress to. The scheme has worked well for many women and it also uh, caused grave injustice to many. Um, and I have been involved over the years in helping lawyers to bring complaints to the Ombudsman and judicial review actions in the High Court relating to the lack of fair procedures in this administrative redress scheme. For example, that the Department of Justice did not consider the women's own testimony of their duration of stay in an institution to be evidence when the nuns had no records or were disputing what a woman said about how long she was there. Um, for example, um, one thing that was recommended in terms of redress was that the women would meet each other and be enabled to discuss memorialization. And the government, having not established this element of the scheme, um, myself and my colleagues, along with uh, Nora Casey, a prominent businesswoman in Ireland, uh, decided in 2018 to gather the women together ourselves. And we managed to obtain um, funding through the very committed involvement once we had put the plan together of Minister for Justice at the time, Charlie Flanagan. And so over 200 women came together for three days in Dublin in 2018 and were fated by the president, then Michael D. Higgins, numerous artists. We had an amazing dinner. Hundreds of people came out onto the streets to meet them. And um, importantly, uh, in the morning of the second day, 
over 100 of the women sat down in the round room of the mansion house, facilitated by academics in tables of 10 and discussed what they would like the public to know and to do about their experiences. And those reflections of the women are um, reported on in a Dublin Honours Magdalene's report that's on the Justice for Magdalene's webpage. And at this time, one of the reasons we also chose that time to galvanise uh, public support and to bring the women together, it was because Dublin City Council was planning to sell the Sean McDermott Street Magdalene Laundry site to a Japanese budget hotel chain for 14 million euro. This is a 2.3 acre site in Dublin city centre that is the only Magdalene Laundry that was the last Magdalene Laundry to close in 1996 and that Dublin city council had obtained from the nuns in a land swap but had lain derelict for 20 years. And having spoken to the women about what they would like and combining that with the recommendations of the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse and numerous other consultations that had been done with survivors over the years, we proposed and in 2021 were successful in obtaining government commitment to a national site of conscience at that site, which is now underway. Um, with a five-year time frame for its establishment, which will include housing for older people, community education, um, social services for the community, and an annex of the National Archives and an annex of the National Museum. Um, in 2015, very briefly, uh, just to state, in 2015, while all of this work on the Magdalene Laundries was ongoing, the government established a commission of investigation into the mother and baby homes, which is a related set of institutions. And this was on foot of a lot of publicity given to the tireless work of Catherine Corliss in establishing the fate of almost 900 babies or children who died in the Chu mother and baby home who were buried, it would seem, in a disused septic facility that is still not exhumed um, to this day. And because of what we had learned in relation to the Magdalene Laundry Committee inquiry and the importance of a parallel process when you have no idea how this inquiry is going to pan out, um, myself and Claire McGettrick got together with Hogan Lovell's international law firm, their London office, and they provided more than 50 solicitors to help more than 82 people submit full witness statements to the Mother and Baby Homes Commission. And this was important because the commission wasn't providing legal assistance to survivors. Meanwhile, alleged wrongdoers were legally represented, you know, of their own accord. Um, the commission was not providing a transcript to people who went to give their testimony, so you couldn't have a copy of what you had said. Um, we felt that people may wish to have this testimony for future purposes so that they wouldn't have to go through the entire ordeal again and again. But also we wanted to be able to analyze what people were saying and to make those legal arguments and to rec make recommendations based you know, on the carefully uh, put together evidence of the very people affected. That was really important because unfortunately, the Mother and Baby Homes Commission made findings such as that there was very little evidence that children were forcibly taken from their mothers. That although some mothers are of the opinion that their consent was not full free and informed, there is no evidence that that was their view at the time of the adoption. Um, that um, there's no evidence of injury as a result of vaccine trials. Many findings that are directly contradicted by the uh, survivor's own testimony. And so eight people who have participated in the clan project brought judicial review proceedings um, which the government settled in 2021, uh, admitting that the Mother and Baby Homes Commission had denied them fair procedures. Um, so I think it's because it'll come out in questions, it's just worth stating that in 2021, I um, was commissioned by the Northern Ireland Executive to work with survivors in Northern Ireland who have experienced very similar um, abuses who have learned a lot from watching, but also some people being impacted both north and south by participating in the systems that have been set up in the south 
And together we made recommendations at the end of 2021, which are now beginning to be implemented for a state investigation into Northern Ireland's mother and baby Magdalene and workhouse institutions. So um, kind of key reflections are one, I think I've learned a lot about the importance of lawyering outside of court and of using constitutional and other human rights obligations as a language that enables people to give full weight to the experiences that they have had and not to be prohibited from doing that by the barriers that exist to accessing um, court, which are great and many. Um, secondly, that we have definitely seen these specialised investigations um, actually taking the place of access to the ordinary democratic justice institutions um, of the states north and south. And that is highly problematic and absolutely contrary to the notion of human rights based um, reparation, where the whole point is to enable our institutions to be strengthened by the participation of people who've been subjected to heinous um, violence and abuse. Um, thirdly, that abuse is continuing. When it comes to family separation, a lack of access to information means that enforced disappearances from an international legal perspective are evident. Um, and um, lack of access to, to information is one of the biggest problems with the um, processes that have been put in place. And then finally, um, I suppose the final reflection is just to the point I made at the beginning that really what transitional justice and human rights based um, reparation asks of us is to question how what people who are affected by such awful abuse um, have to tell us and how they want to participate in um, the remaking of our society and of our democratic, supposedly democratic state. So. Sorry, Barry, now for going over time a bit, but that is hopefully a good enough summary to enable some questions and answers now. Roma, it was absolutely wonderful and, and thanks. You could go on and we could go on listening, but I think it is a good time to invite Eugenio in. I think you have a couple of things to put to me, Eugenio. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, the work you've done and you're doing is phenomenal. It's one of the most important campaigns in the history of modern Ireland and certainly in the 21st century by far. And so I've been admiring your work for a long time, but now I'm delighted to engage in this conversation this evening. And the starting point for my, from my especially from my point of view as a historian, um, would be to ask you, how will you compare the situation in Northern Ireland and uh, with that in the Republic, also in view of the, different, uh, the difference between the two legal systems and in fact, in Northern Ireland, had from the 1940s, from the late 1940s, a fairly advanced system of welfare, uh, within which the state played a much more, much more important role than than the state did in the Republic. That's a really interesting question, um, Eugenio. I think I'll begin actually um, by just reflecting on the justice mechanisms because this is something that has come up in the very recent debate also about the troubles. And that is um, just one thing uh, that the inquest system is, is, is far more developed in terms of the established rules around compliance with the European Convention on Human Rights, the need to, um, the need to uh, look into um, questions, circumstantial questions, not just direct questions about if we were to think about deaths and disappearances in mother and baby homes, um, about the broader circumstances. This is one of the requirements of an effective investigation uh, under European Convention um, on Human Rights case law. The participation of family members in inquests, the right to legal representation. So um, it's highly problematic in relation to the troubles that the inquest system is effectively to be shut down. And when I've been listening to the debates on the recent legislation, um, the Legacy Act, I've been thinking this is exactly what has been happening uh, in respect of our, the Republic of Ireland's institutional abuses. Um, that the survivors of the worst atrocities 
or some of the worst atrocities are actually being siphoned off into a parallel supposed justice system. Um, and what survivors told me and my fellow independent panel members, um, Deirdre Mahan and Phil Sprayton, when we were working together in 2021, was that it's really important for the existing justice mechanisms also to operate. And the now beginning inquiry in Northern Ireland into mother and baby homes, Magdalene Laundries and workhouse institutions, we have given it a specific mandate through our recommendations, which the um, executive office accepted in full to facilitate the operation of ordinary justice not to substitute for it. And that means in concrete terms to, to gather administrative archives for the purpose of publishing them, to assist individuals to access their records as a way of enabling them to participate in an investigation. People rightly say, how am I supposed to and why should I have to give my testimony to a truth telling enterprise, uh, be it an independent panel, a public inquiry, without access to the records of my identity um, or of what the circumstances in which I was um, uh, relinquished for adoption. Um, and so we have, and, and it is groundbreaking, I think, um, certainly on this island, made it a requirement of the investigation that first and foremost, it works on ceasing ongoing situations of disappearance and um, that it is there first and foremost for the people affected and that what it does not do, as was done with the Mother and Baby Homes Commission in the South, is almost operate for the general public, uh, leaving the very survivors aside. Um, I worked with people and Hogan Lovell's solicitors worked with people who wrote the Mother Maybe Homes Commission in the Republic of Ireland asking for records that were obvious the commission held because it might have written something in its one of its interim reports that made it obvious it knew where somebody's baby was buried. And the commission wrote back to say we are not giving anybody access to their records, even after 2018 when EU GDPR came in and people had to write to their personal data. Um, so I think that the ordinary justice system holds more promise in the North and more has been learned and accepted by the judicial system in the UK in terms of when you are investigating uh, questions of torture or cruel or inhuman or degrading treatment or unlawful um, taking or loss of life that actually you have to do it in a way that complies with people's basic rights to participate, to have access to information, to comment, to direct lines of inquiry. So the question is, given that that is a more advanced system, will these specialized investigations kind of interact and learn from that and enable the strengthening of that? Or will they actually kind of completely avoid that system because of the cost, I suppose, that would be incurred by putting it to work on what are some of our worst abuses. Um, in tune, the government has come up with in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, new legislation uh, to enable exhumation, identification where possible and reburial of infant remains without an inquiry, whereas the inquest system could have been used. It might have needed some new updating legislation of some sort, some secondary legislation, perhaps if there were issues around um, newer technologies, but it could have been used because if you or I discovered unmarked remains in our garden in the Republic of Ireland, there would not be new legislation needed to exhume that grave. And yet um, the grave that Catherine Corliss did so much work on remains uh, without exhumation today. So that's, I know a long answer on that question of the institutional structures in Northern Ireland, but I think it's one worth making technical as it may be. Um, in terms of the welfare system, I think it just means that yes, in Northern Ireland, there seems to be, um, when it comes to where records are, who is involved in adoption, yes, there's a lot of state involvement um, and maybe a more statutory basis for the system, but the facts of the coercion 
um, the religious and more, you know, the religiously moral underpinnings of where the culture of forced separation of unmarried mothers and unmarried families from their babies is coming from seems to be extremely similar. And certainly um, research conducted by Leanne McCormick and Sean O'Connell, which was a precursor in 2020 to our work with survivors in 2021, found, you know, because the religious orders were cross-border, all-island operations, the transfer um, of girls and women and babies didn't take account of um, borders. And so um, the practices, I think, were very similar. Uh, it's just that there is a maybe a slightly different mix of institutions involved. And it does, of course, then bring up different questions, additional questions about how to access information. So just let me grasp the full seriousness of the situation, not only where people unlawfully detained and disappeared, but they could also be transferred across the border without any form of state control or constitutional guarantee of the status. Absolutely. So um, Sean O'Connell and Leanne McCormick found, because they did have access to religious records, but not in a way that they were able to then reproduce. They had very limited access, but they were able to make their findings known. Um, they estimated that 11.5 of girls and women who entered mother and baby institutions in Northern Ireland had home addresses in the Republic of Ireland. Um, of those institutionalized in Northern Ireland's Magdalene laundries, an estimated 30% in the dairy institution appear to have come from the Republic of Ireland, many through referral by the Sisters of Mercy at the Stranorler County Home, which was a mother and baby institution, and then coming across at the border into Derry. And there's evidence that a magistrate, for example, in Donegal used the Magdalene Laundry in Derry as an alternative to prison. Um, approximately 14% of girls and women in the Belfast Magdalene Laundry appear to have been transferred from Northern Ireland, just for example. And then um, cross-border adoption is very evident. And I think there, the questions of legality, the questions of access to justice now, I mean, they're extremely complex. And the very first thing that people want is access to information. Um, you can't use court whether to bring a case for personal injury. You can't demand an inquest. You can't effectively pressure the police to investigate a potential crime um, without evidence that without records um, that were created, uh, it's just not, it's not practical to expect. Um, and so we're really still at the stage where people cannot access their own personal files in Northern Ireland. Um, and this is something they are now stating so clearly to the independent panel that has begun its work that through our recommendations joined with the over 100 survivors who participated in the process of design, truth recovery design. Um, that panel includes an archivist, a genealogist, a sociologist, a human rights lawyer, historians, um, with the aim of actually, and, and, and three people with personal experience, um, with the aim of actually first and foremost attempting to assist people in their own truth telling so that they can then participate in the societal effort. And it may be that the forthcoming public inquiry uh, is needed to use its powers to compel. And it would, unfortunately, in my experience, be highly unusual, but it's so necessary for a public inquiry to actually do the first job of assisting people to access their own information. We tend to think of public inquiries and these truth telling exercises as something that society needs, and that is absolutely the case. But there is this irony that the people directly affected need them and are often just completely ignored by them because these inquiries are also serving a political purpose. And more malevolently, I would say, in the experience anyway, south of the border, whether intentional or not, they have served the purpose of shoring up evidence that would enable any other justice mechanism to function.
because their underpinning legislation states that the records gathered cannot be used in criminal proceedings. Um, the inquiries have refused to release personal data to people, even though they have been able to hold public hearings, they've refused to do so. So that is how they've operated. They've actually shored up evidence um, and hopefully the process that's getting underway in Northern Ireland will do the exact opposite. Thank you, Mev. I know that Barry is eager to ask questions from the floor, but I have one more question I would like to raise, and that is, what are the implications of this very important set of inquiries for the future of the island of Ireland? Um, so I have great hopes that we will see a different type of inquiry in Northern Ireland to the types that have gone before, um, whether that's in Northern Ireland or in the Republic. Survivors in Northern Ireland spoke about their experience of the Heart Inquiry, which investigated Northern Ireland's childhood residential institutions. So similarly to the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse in the South, and they spoke of, and academics have researched the experience of being put on the witness stand and then being confronted with their records that they hadn't known about um, beforehand. Uh, and I know I keep talking about records, but it's absolutely the number one issue and then everything else follows. And um, so I have hopes that survivors being in the driving seat of the now beginning independent panel, which will feed into a forthcoming public inquiry, will actually turn all of that on its head and prioritize access to the truth for those directly affected. Simple as that may sound. Um, and then uh, once there is actual access to documents, it remains to be seen how people might use these to search for further forms of justice. But transparency is, of course, absolutely central. Um, I um, think that there is um, a huge opportunity in the national site of conscience that the government has committed to in Sean McDermott Street. I think that the inquiries that I'm talking about, the redress schemes, the apologies, these should all just be seen as the beginning of what will be a permanent process of truth telling. And that will, you know, come in time to include other issues, related issues, causes that will hopefully serve as sites for discussion of today's um, ongoing social injustice. So the notion of an annex of the National Museum and annex of the National Archives combined with social housing and um, community education and the notion that that would not just be an isolated site but combined and um, that would combine this is the plan that the government has committed to that would also feed into regional or local sites of conscience and um, I think is highly promising and certainly in the Northern Ireland recommendations a key one was that there would be similarly a national archive through, for example, ideally, uh, the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland that would cooperate with an annex of the National Archives of Ireland in the South to enable, um, I suppose, permanent truth telling as a result of this investigation. In terms of institutional reform, I find it very interesting that we are hopefully in 2024 in the Republic of Ireland going to have a referendum on care. I personally, think that statutory rights to care are absolutely essential. And having worked as a barrister in London, um, I came face to face, of course, with the notion of taking judicial review action against a local authority for failing to act in accordance with legislation that implements the welfare state that in Ireland people think exists. But if you ever actually need one of those social services, you will find that it is completely dependent on the gift of whatever authority, the time of year, the amount that's in a budget. We even hear of, um, only on the news this week, uh, older people's care services, home care being drastically reduced. We know of the issue with um, children with special educational needs, with um, of really anyone with a need for care from the state, um, having to go cap in hand and not having a right um, that is identifiable 
um, that is quantifiable as well from a budgetary perspective for the state and that then there is accountability for. So it's highly unusual, I would say, um, for a country that claims to be a welfare state to not actually give people rights in law, but through our history to simply pay in the past and still to a certain extent, uh, religious organizations and other private um, entities or charitable entities to provide those, um, but with no oversight. That is not normal. And I think that one thing I would love to see um, as a way forward, taking into account everything we are learning about how this institutional and family separation abuse happened is actual rights that people can rely on um, in court if necessary and that function to actually create rights holders um, out of all of us individuals who at one point or another rely on the state for care. Thank you. Barry, over to you. Thank you, Eugenio. And I'll, I'll come back to you at the end if we have a moment or two. We might. I apologize, Maeve, if there is some ambient noise where I am. I've had to move location. Um, but if you can hear me okay, um, I'm always moved by that point you make uh, about having to study or to study or work on human rights. You don't have to leave Ireland. And also what you say about this notion of the abuse being ongoing, because I followed, we graduated around the same time. And I remember following all those events as they unraveled and thinking it was something historical, but it's really not the access to information and even reburials and these things. It's al almost unspeakable. And just the, the way you speak about it is just so persuasive and so impressive. Um, I have two small but related questions, and then I'll, I'll go into the questions and answers for a couple. How peculiar is this form of historical abuse to the island of Ireland, do you know? Are there useful international comparators? As, as a total non-expert, I, I think of some of the things around industrial schools that I read about. Is it something that is really peculiar to this island, or is there useful comparisons that can be made? And then relatedly, Maeve, you note know how the religious orders were all island, so in terms of your work in the north, but these are also global entities, uh, many of them. Is there any evidence of kind of similar activities that you're aware of in places where the religious orders were active outside of these islands, this island rather, or again, was it peculiar to this island? Um, I think this is a really important point. Certainly the um, Magdalene laundries were not unique to Ireland. Mother and Baby Homes, the um, Mother and Baby Homes Commission of Investigation uh, decided that actually um, there is no abuse worth redressing that occurred before six months uh, in Irish Mother and Baby Homes because similar Mother and Baby Homes operated elsewhere in Europe and it was unique more unique that Ireland kept many women in the institutions longer than six months. Um, unfortunately, therefore, we actually see a redress scheme uh, now in the Republic of Ireland for the mother and baby homes that excludes anybody who was born but taken from their mother before the age of six months, uh, which is actually more than half of the people born in mother and baby homes um, because also the Mother and Baby Homes Commission didn't find any abuse in the fact of separation. It didn't uh, believe the women who said that they didn't give consent, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but the judicial reviews have established through the consent of the government at any rate that, um, that women who said those things to the Mother and Baby Homes Commission were denied their fair procedures because they we're not given the chance to see or comment on draft findings of the commission, whereas the alleged wrongdoers were, and were also they were also given the evidence that concerned them, whereas the survivors had no access to anything that anybody else was telling the um, commission. So certainly the institutions um, operated elsewhere, um, and we know that there have been a variety of committees and investigations on um, England's mother and baby homes at the at the very least a parliamentary human rights committee report um, certainly there's advocacy going on there and I'm in touch with lawyers in the Netherlands who are working on uh, Magdalene laundries and mother and baby homes there and um, certainly we are contacted by people who are working on um, 
the issue of Magdalene laundries and mother and baby homes in America, in Australia, for example. Um, so I, I suppose I'm not a, a European historian and um, my focus has always been on state responsibility for human rights violations. And it does bring up lots of questions then whenever I'm, uh, you know, presenting, people are asking about the church's responsibility. In fact, Barry, I think your second question is exactly that. Um, and what about the church? And, and absolutely, these questions are so important. I have to confess that because of how human rights law works and now to make things more complicated under the Irish constitution, you could take a constitutional rights case against a private individual or organization, but because in the main, uh, human rights laws are for the state to enforce, I have always focused on state responsibility for regulating and for redressing what happens in the arena of social care. Um, and because it's in the gift of the state now to force production of records, for example, from private entities to enable access to justice, that's where my focus has been. Um, but I don't uh, disagree that there's so much work to be done in relation to the fact that the church is a global organisation. Um, that even when it comes to records, and certainly finances that, for example, to Magdalene Laundry's orders were French, that many of the orders have operations in other countries that, you know, questions of where property is, be it records or other, um, you know, are global questions or, um, yeah, and I just uh, have to confess that it's such an enormous issue um, that it's just... I have only found it possible to really focus on the question of state responsibility in Ireland for failings in the past and ensuring justice in the present. Um, and I think there's so much work to be done then to link in with what's going on in other countries and to question how to achieve some form of church accountability as well. Thanks, Maeve. I'm going to put two kind of quite different questions to you just to uh, to involve the audience a little bit and then Eugenio I'll hand over to you on close closer to the hour in three or four minutes just to just to conclude the first one may have comes from John Ranla and it's a multi-part question but all the parts are quite short John says and good evening John good to have you with us one of your themes is the importance of non-Irish London mostly help why was this why wasn't it Irish and also from John, did what Maeve is describing occur before 1921, or is it in fact an independent Ireland development? And from a slightly different tack, I do want to, to welcome Orla Hogan as well, who is an under, undergraduate student. And Orla asked an important question, what are the best ways for students to get involved in writing or uncovering information about the Magdalene Laundries? As an undergraduate history student writing a dissertation on the Laundries, uh, should be interested in hearing which areas you think are the most pressing for historians to work on. I think we've got a little bit of that actually a moment ago, but yeah. if you want to tackle John and Orla's questions, maybe. Um, yes, London Help. I think he's talking about the lawyers. So um, it is, I mean, it is the case that big law firms in Ireland tend to represent state or religious interests, and it's very difficult, therefore, to... Um, yeah, to actually obtain, you know, firm wide assistance uh, that doesn't involve a conflict that a firm can knock it into. So we that is one thing that just is the case. And I've certainly kind of come up against. Um, and also, though, Hogan Lovells is an absolutely enormous law firm, one of the world's biggest and so they were in a position to offer the kind of level of assistance that we needed. I mean, even creating, you know, the ethical protocols, um, the advertising materials, and then having the ability to be in communication regularly with the Mother and Baby Homes Commission to offer a level of service that each individual person who wanted to provide their testimony deserved and needed was an absolutely enormous undertaking. 
and uh, I think therefore it, yeah, it it makes sense that it was a large law firm that did that. Now, in saying that, um, we've had assistance from smaller firms in Ireland, from individual barristers, numerous. Um, I had more than twenty five barristers from the Bar of Ireland analyze the law that related to adoption and mother and baby homes for the purpose of informing the clan report, which I then used to put together with what people were saying in their witness statements. Um, we've had the assistance of smaller law firms and other bigger law firms to in ways that's more research based, for example, um, in relation to judicial review actions, complaints to the ombudsman, the types of non-court legal assistance that people need, for example, to get access to counselling that they're on a years long waiting list for. So certainly we have lawyers every um, every week, every month in Ireland doing individual pieces of work for survivors. Um, in terms of the second question was 1921. Uh, no, the, the institutions that I'm talking about absolutely existed in Ireland and in the UK and elsewhere in the world before the 20th century. I think that it's fairly well established that they took on a particularly carceral um, purpose and function from the foundation of the Irish state, although... Um, I would stand to be corrected, but uh, certainly those institutions had a very clear um, uh, relationship with the uh, deliberate effort of removing problematic girls and women from the public sphere as part of the formation of the nation state. I think um, it is fair to say. And again, I think, again, this area is one that is um, needing of lots of truth telling and research. Um, and then in terms of uh, students being involved, um, um, what can I say? I think that it's really important to get to grips with the testimony of the people who have spoken out with everything that they have already offered to us. So um, in terms of research and then analysis and communication. Um, there is so much that people affected have offered. There are oral histories, um, you know, collected by numerous uh, academics and reported upon. Um, there are people's own, it's wonderful to see people's own life writing, um, huge amounts of that. Um, there's lots of advocacy by people directly affected, lots of artistic um, work. And so I suppose that's my first, um, yeah, my just my instinctual reaction that what we can do most importantly is to engage with that firsthand um, experience that has been told and also ongoing advocacy and to kind of support and engage with what people directly affected are saying. Um, and they are communicating uh, on the radio, on the television, in writing, in books, in artistic performances. And I think we absolutely need to support that. Um, and kind of from there comes everything else. Once you are listening and engaging with what people affected are doing and saying, then it becomes clear what we need to do when we are writing to our elected representatives or um, I suppose engaging with those around us, be it family or friends, um, or in our public academic analysis, what we are saying. Maeve, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Jenny, in a moment, but just to really sincerely thank you for your time and indeed for your work. And it's it's great and great importance. I want to thank Iona Clark, and uh, who's our research assistant on the series, and indeed uh, and Neve Gallagher, my co-convener. This was a great session, and the next one is scheduled now for the 20th of November, where Jonathan Powell, former Denning Street Chief of Staff and Chief British Negotiator in Northern Ireland from 1997 to 2007, indeed the author of one of my favourite books on on that time, Great Hater, Little, Great Hater, Little Room, will be with us at 6 o'clock on Monday the 20th of November. Uh, but may have just for myself uh, a huge thanks and over to you Jenny would you like to uh, conclude things for us 
Well, I can only say a huge thanks for, from myself personally, from the community of historians, everybody interested in Irish history is immensely grateful to you. And it seems that your, your work has opened up new horizons in the study of so many dimensions of modern Irish history in the 20th century and the relationship between North and South and the relationship between pre-independence and post-independence Ireland in terms of human rights and civil rights. So thank you, Mev, and I look forward to seeing you in Cambridge before too long, speaking at one of our seminars. Thank you so much for having me and to everybody I can't see for coming. Thanks, Millie Mav. Until next time, so long live. Thank you all for being with us. And for those whose questions you couldn't get to, we only apologize, but I will send them on to Mav by email so Mav knows what questions people would have put to her if we have more time. Good night, everybody.